Welcome back to another Mech Deck Tech. Today we have another pre-con from Thunder Junction with Desert Bloom, helmed by Yuma Proud Protector. This Naya Commander is looking to mess around in the desert. So they are a 6-6 for 8 mana, a little expensive, but they do cost one less for each land in your grave, so we're looking to sacrifice a lot of lands and get a lot of value off them being recurred and being sacked. Speaking of sacking those lands, whenever he enters the battlefield or attacks, we get to sacrifice a land. If we do, we get to draw a card. If a desert is put into our grave from anywhere, we get to create a 4-2 plant warrior creature token with reach. So we kind of have a little bit of a go wide strategy happening here. Naya is kind of infamous for doing some like token strats. And it's going to be a good time, as always though, we are going to take 10 cards out that didn't quite make the cut, and add 10 cards in that I think kind of beef up this stack a little bit. We will try and stick to a loose budget, right? We're not trying to drop like 20 plus dollars on a single card, uh, but we will get into some of those expensive additions after the deck tech itself is done. That being said, let's take a look at what didn't make the cut. Starting off, we have Bitter Reunion. Two cost enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, we get to discard a card to draw two cards. So, ultimately, net zero cards, right? We spent one card to play the enchantment, one card to discard. We're getting two cards back. Not the worst, but not the best. Uh, in this deck, I feel like ideally we're discarding a land to draw two cards. We are playing a decent number of lands, which makes sense for a Lands Matter deck. Um, and we could also pay a single one to sacrifice this and give all of our creatures haste. Uh, definitely not a bad card, but I think we have better ways of getting rid of lands. We have a lot of card draw already in the deck. I feel like we could cut this one and not have an issue. Chromatic Lantern. So it is a three cost mana rock, which we know we are generally against. It is mana fixing in the sense that all of our lands can now tap for any color, and it on its own taps for a mana of any color as well. It's really the fact that it's a three cost rock that, you know, has me cutting it. I feel like we have a lot of ways of already mana fixing, so we're not overly concerned about this effect. Crawling Sensation, a three cost enchantment. We may mill two cards that are upkeep. And whenever one or more lands are put into a grave from anywhere for the first time each turn, we're going to create a little 1-1 green insect creature token. So again, I feel like this card kind of is on theme, but, you know, without adding things that are going to let us keep track of what's on top of the deck at all times, you know, we don't have a lot of ways of recurring things that aren't lands, and we wouldn't want to mill any of our key pieces. Eccentric Farmer, a 3 cost 2 3 human peasant. When they enter, we again mill 3 cards. We get to return a land from grave to hand. This is honestly a little counterintuitive, in my opinion. Right? We want those lands in the grave. We will eventually cheat them back out. But when we cheat them back out, we'd rather they were cheated back out to the field and not to hand. Embrace the Unknown. 3 cost sorcery, we get to exile the top 2 cards of our library until the end of our next turn, we can play those cards, and it has Retrace. Retrace allowing us to discard a land in addition to paying the cost of the spell to recast it from Grave. So Impulse Draw is generally good, but I think we'll like, you know, again it's a situation where you play it a little early and there's some expensive cards, we might not be able to play them, and then what, they're just stuck in exile? We don't want that. Ah, uh, so embrace the unknown. You're out of here. If we had some exile cast payoffs, I feel like they might stick. But for now, we're going to let them be. Hour of Promise. Five mana sorcery. We get to search it for up to two lands. Could be any lands. Not basics, not specifically deserts. Though, if we do have a couple deserts already on the field... We do get a bonus in the form of two 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens. Honestly, it's decent ramp. It lets us look for any land. It is 5 mana though, and that 5 mana cost is honestly why I cut it. Nantuko Cultivator. 
4 mana, 2-2, two, two, Insect Druid. When it enters the battlefield, we can discard any number of lands and put that many plus one plus one counters on it and draw that many cards. So, potentially very big Insect for 4. Depending on how many lands we just happen to have in hand, we are playing a slightly above average number. However, it's 4 mana for a 2-2 two, two that requires us to have lands in hand. And I can't guarantee that we're always going to and sure, it replaces the lands that we're discarding, which is a nice effect, but unless we are kind of set up for this turn, right, having at least, in my mind, three lands in hand to discard to make him kind of worth that value, I think he's honestly a little dead in hand. Perpetual Timepiece. Two cost artifact, you could tap to mill two cards, we could tap two in exile to shuffle any number of target cards from our grave into our library. Uh, so... Again, not bad. This deck kind of wants to do a little bit of self-mill. Uh, it really depends on what's on top. We do have a few ways of looking at what's on top. But I feel like we have other ways of handling this. Skull Winder. Three cost, one three snake with death touch. So not bad stats, not a bad keyword. When they enter the battlefield, we get to return a card from grave to hand, and then we choose an opponent to also return a card from their grave to their hand. So, honestly, the fact that this is slight group hug is why I cut it. I feel like, you know, we could run other three-cost green creatures and be the only ones to get a card back to hand. So why would we run this? For the death touch? I mean, like, sure, a fine blocker, but I'd rather not let an opponent reuse a card. Turn Timber Sower is our final cut. Another three costs. We really cut a lot of cards at three, it looks like. Ooh, how many we got in here? <laughs> Six things at, uh, at three cost. That's okay, though. But one or more lands are put into the grave. From anywhere, we're going to create a single 0-1 green plant creature token. We could pay a single green and sack three creatures, likely being these plants, to return a land from grave to hand. Uh, if it were grave to field, I'd feel a little better about it. Um, that being said, uh, they didn't make the cut. They're out of here. So let's go take a look at what did, in fact, make the cut as an addition. Starting off with the enchantments, we have Undergrowth Recon, a 3-cost enchantment that at the beginning of our upkeep returns a land from Grave to Battlefield tapped. Now, our commander does gain benefits from lands being in the Grave in terms of a mana reduction, but I assure you, if those lands are also in the field, not only does that still allow us to use them to pay for our commander, but it allows us to pay for other spells as well. So, I feel like having them cheated back every turn is fine. Ace of the Locked Hothouse. So, for four mana, we have a case which we could solve. Immediately, we get to play an extra land on each of our turns. This is really relevant. We are a lands matters deck. We're trying to get a bunch of lands in the grave. You know... We have ways of playing those back later. We'll get into those in a minute. And once we have seven or more lands, we do solve this case. Which allows us to look at the top card of our library at any time and play lands and cast creatures as well as enchantments off the top. Uh, the creatures and lands are the big part. We only have four enchantments total in the deck, so like not super relevant, but I think we could... We could achieve this case. We're going to solve it real quick. Moving up into our artifacts, we've only added a single one, and that is Conduit of Worlds. Conduit of Worlds is a four-cost artifact, which lets us play land some grave. We also have the option of tapping it and choosing a non-land permanent card in grave. If we haven't cast a spell this turn, we get to cast that card. If we do, we don't get to cast any other spells this turn. We could only activate it at sorcery speed. So, you know, if we have a big thing in our grave that we'd rather cheat back than cast anything that happens to be in our hand, this gives us that option. Uh, but it's really here for that first effect, which is just letting us replay the lands that are in our grave. 
Moving up into some spell slinging, we have Summer Bloom. So a two-cost sorcery that lets us play up to three additional lands this turn. So this is super strong, especially once we have ways of playing lands from our grave. You know, we've been sacking lands all game, we want to get a bunch back. Bam. And they don't enter tapped by default, uh, so any lands that normally would come in untapped get to remain that way. A lot of the things that cheat back lands for us or let us play extras tend to have them come into play tapped. Speaking of cheating back lands, we have Splendid Reclamation. Four cost sorcery returning all lands from our grave to the battlefield tapped. So, ah, uh, we've sacrificed like a bunch of lands to like get a bunch of really cool effects. Nah, Splendid Reclamation's like, nah dog, you got all those back, it's cool. Moving up into our creature slots, we have Lotus Cobra. Landfall, whenever land enters the battlefield under our control, we do get to add one mana of any color. This is just ramp, plain and simple. It works super well with any of the things that let us cheat out lands, even the ones that come in tapped. They're going to generate value for us immediately. Courser of Crufix lets us play with the top card revealed. We get to play lands off the top, and whenever lands enter the battlefield under our control, we are going to gain one life. Last of our creature additions is Azusa, Lost But Seeking, which lets us play two extra lands on each turn, which is just good, right? We have a lot of lands, we want to be playing them, we want to be sacking them, we want to be just churning through our deck, and Azusa is going to help us get there a little faster. Last of our additions is Ren and Realmbreaker, a three-cost Planeswalker that gives all of our lands the same ability that the Chromatic Lantern took out. So our lands are going to tap for any color. We could use his plus one ability to turn a land into a 3-3 elemental. We could minus two to mill three cards and put a permanent from among those milled into our hand. That could be a land, but it could also be an artifact, creature, enchantment, but more importantly, we have his emblem, the, the coup de grace of really any planeswalker. If we get him up to seven loyalty, we could crack him. Get an emblem that lets us play lands and cast permanents from our grave, and emblems still can't be interacted with in any way, so this is a chef's kiss emblem for this deck, which is looking to sack off all of our lands. Alright guys, we're moving down into Honorable Mentions. Ren and Six. Two mana, Planeswalker. Plus one lets us return a land from grave to hand. Not bad. Minus one, they're going to deal one damage to a target. Kind of garbage, but fine. And minus seven, we get an emblem where instant sorceries in our grave have retrace. Definitely not a bad emblem. Uh, this lets us discard lands to recast all of our spells that are in our grave. Pretty strong. They didn't make the cut because it's a little less relevant in this deck. Just because we don't have an overabundance of instants and sorceries. Uh, and they're also sitting around like the $25 mark. So a little too expensive to be budget. Birds of Paradise is just good mana dork. Uh, they're not quite budget. They sit around like the $5 to $8 mark. So a little too expensive, but definitely good. Bristly Bill, Spine Sower. Two costs, two, two, landfall. Passes out a plus one, plus one counter. And for five mana, we could double the plus one, plus one counters on each of our creatures. Uh, being a land matters deck, I think that like Bristly Bill, Spine Sower is good. Um, that being said, I feel like he would actually do better work in a plus one plus one counter matters deck. Dryad of the Elysian Grove lets us play an extra land on each turn, and lands we control are every basic type in addition to their other types, meaning that they're going to all tap for every color. Elbeth Reclaimer really fits the strategy of this deck well. It gets plus two plus two as long as we have at least three lands in grave, so they start off as a 1-2, but could easily become a 3-4. And for 2 mana and tapping, we get to sack our land, look for a new land, and put it in the battlefield tap, and shuffle. 
Similar spot, Knight of the Reliquary. 3 cost 2-2, two, two, gets plus 1, plus 1 for each land in our grave, so it could be very large. Uh, we get to sacrifice a forest or plains to search for a land and put it under the battlefield, and then shuffle. Maha, Bredegar Protector. 5 cost 2-3. Universal Lord and Landfall create 1-1 one, one Human Warrior Creature Tokens. Very budget. A little expensive for what he does, but he does let you go wide pretty quick in this deck. Mina and Den Wildborn. Extra lands, we love that. Return a land to its owner's hand to give it a single creature trample for the turn. Not bad. Kind of lots us, I mean, especially with us being able to play extra lands all the time anyways, could be useful. Wayward Sword Tooth, more extra lands on every turn. Uh, can't attack or block until we have the city's blessing, but that should be fine. We'll hit it really quickly. The Tireless Duo between Tracker and Provisioner. So, Landfall create tokens. Tokens are good value here. Uh, so, we have access to food, clue, and treasure. Tiller Engine is actually really strong in this deck. I might have put it in as my, like, 11th card if I was going that far. Because it makes it so whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we could either untap a land, uh, specifically the land that came in tapped, or we could tap a non-land permanent in opponent controls. Sylvan Safekeeper. Lots of sack of land to give a creature a shroud. We can do this at instant speed. They are $15 to $20, so not budget, but fit the theme rather well. Outcaster, Green Blade. Three cost, one two. When the ETB, we do search for a basic land or desert. Almost always a desert in this case. We get to put it in our hand. They do get bigger for each desert we control. Dance of the Tumbleweeds. So we get to search for a basic land or desert, put it on the battlefield, and shuffle. Or we get to create a XX elemental creature where X is number of lands we control. Uh, we could do both for a total of six mana. We could do the search for three or the creation for five. Left from the loam lets us return three lands from grave to hand, and we could use it as a dredge mechanic to mill cards. Nahiri's Lithoforming, X cost spell, we get to sacrifice lands, for each land sacrifice we're going to draw a card. We can play additional lands for each land we sacked, and those lands are going to enter the battlefield tapped. Nature's Lore specifically lets us search up a forest. There are a couple of non-desert cards that are going to be of the forest variety, so it does go on to the battlefield. Not tapped, very strong, huzzah. Escape Shift lets us just sacrifice any number of lands to search our deck for that many, put them onto the battlefield tapped, and shuffle. Sylvan Scrying lets us search for a land, reveal it, put in hand, then shuffle. Three Visits is shockingly not budget. We do look for a forest and put it on the battlefield and then shuffle. It's the fact that it doesn't come in tapped that makes it a little unbudget, around five bucks, but still very strong. World Soul's Rage, another X cost spell, is going to deal X damage to a target, and we get to put up to X lands, specifically from hand or graveyard, onto the battlefield tapped. Uh, so this is actually really strong in this deck. We have a lot of ways of obviously getting lands into grave. Uh, fewer ways, I my mind, of like maintaining them in hand. If they're in hand, we're trying to dump them onto the field as quick as possible. Crop Rotation. Let's us sack a land to search for a land to put in the battlefield and then shuffle. Realms Uncharted has a search for four lands, different names, easy enough. An opponent will choose two of them. We're going to put the ones that they choose into the grave and the other two into our hand. Amulet of Vigor really does the same thing that our Tiller engine is here for, which is to allow us to untap things that entered the battlefield tapped. Crucible of World just lets us play lands from our grave, but it's definitely good. Horn of Greed, so whenever a player plays a land, so this won't count for things that cheat lands into play for you. You have to specifically be playing them. But it does let that player draw a card. It's a little group hug, which isn't my style, but it's very strong. It's going to keep our hand full. We're definitely playing more lands than our opponents are. Zern Orb, we get to sacrifice lands at instant speed and gain two life. Valakut Exploration, 3 cost enchantment with landfall, whenever land enters the battlefield we get an impulse draw. We can play it for as long as it remains exiled, but at our end step if there are cards exiled we do put them into grave, into our grave. 
And then we deal damage equal to how many cards we, you know, we put in the bin to each opponent. So pretty strong still. Tectonic Reformation. So each land in our hand has cycling for red. Itself could be cycled for two. So because we're trying to get lands in the grave to cheat back later, uh, cycling them away is fine. Spelunking is an interesting ad. It actually cares about caves, which we're not playing. But whenever it enters the battlefield, we do get to draw a card and play an extra land. As well as gain four life and lands we control will always enter the battlefield untapped, which is actually why it's here. Felidar Retreat is just good landfall, right? We're either creating 2-2 two, two cats or passing out some plus one, not plus one counters. Exploration lets us play an extra land on each turn. Not budget, so it's around like the $12 to $20 mark. Druid class is landfall gain life. We get to play extra lands each turn if we level it up. And if we level it up once more, target land we control becomes a creature with haste and power and toughness equal to the number of lands I, we control, but it remains a land. Burgeoning is also not budget, so it's around like the $25 to $35 mark. Whenever an opponent plays a land, we also get to play a land, specifically from hand. Normally, we don't touch on lands in uh, deck techs, but this is a lands matters deck, so I think it's okay. Arid Archway enters tapped. Whenever it enters the battlefield, we do have to return a land to its owner's hand. If a desert was returned, we do get to surveil one. Uh, it does tap for two mana, though. So, you know, don't underestimate it. Field of the Dead. Whenever Field of the Dead enters the battlefield, it does so tap. It taps for a single colorless mana, but when it or another land enters the battlefield under our control, if we have at least seven lands with different names, and we will, we have a lot of unique deserts in this deck. We get to create two a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. Last up is the Sun Scorched Desert. Enters the battlefield, pings a player, and taps for colorless mana. So Sun Scorched Desert is actually also a crime because it targets a player. But guys, those are the honorable mentions, the upgrade guide, all the doobly-doos. If you enjoy the deck tech, please like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. Uh, we'll be back next Friday with another deck tech for a pre-con from Thunder Junction. And until next time, good luck with your builds.